Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. I just completed my version of a standing desk. It's got some interesting features. There's been a lot of interest in it. Had numerous folks asking me questions, so I thought, hey, why don't we do a video and tell you the whole story? Stay with us. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the notification bell so you'll receive alerts when we release a new video. And anytime we use a special tool, we'll always leave a description down below. All right, let's get to work. In introducing this piece, I should give you a little bit of the backstory and also tell you where the inspiration came from. As a young man, we had a uh, sawmill in our town and I used to go there and buy softwood lumber. We also had a couple of mills that sold hardwood lumber and in that mill they had what was called a standing desk. So if you can imagine uh, a, small, mostly a small operation where the guy running it was also the man who was running out into the yard helping you pick whatever you wanted, come back into the shack, write up your bill and he'd be out again. Up and down out of a seating desk is a little bit awkward so they would have what's called a standing desk. So the customer would be on this side and you'd be over here and I'll show you all the details when we get there. But I just love the concept. I also like shaker furniture and the shaker influence, so you'll see some of that here. And the shakers had similar desks, standing desks. So we decided, or I decided to do that and make it one of our projects. Now I'm gonna get into the wood and all the rest of it, but yeah, the only other thing I wanted to tell you is, is this. Out of all the things that I've built, this has probably been one of the most enjoyable. Love the end result. I think it's absolutely, uh, uh, I was going to say incredible, that's patting myself on the back. The incredible part was the experience of building it, designing it, and going through the whole thing. When I build something from scratch, we usually make a model and then a full-size mock-up. And in this case, we made one out of plywood and pine. It was screwed together. We drew in the joinery so that you could see what it was going to look like since it was a focal part of the piece. And you, because it was screwed together, you could easily make changes. In fact, we had that mock-up in the shop for probably six months and made lots of changes before we finally settled on the actual piece. When you build a piece of furniture or cabinets, usually you have what are called primary woods and secondary woods. First, the primary wood in this one is cherry, also known as black cherry, readily available, available in North America. Also has some cherry veneer. And the secondary wood, which really isn't a secondary wood if you consider the cost, is something called holly. So let me show you it in its rough form. I was fortunate, I had, I had some beautiful cherry boards and I was able to take most all of that out of one or two boards. So that meant that the color was going to be really close. So there's a piece of, of black cherry and I try to avoid the sapwood, which is on the outer part of the tree, which tends to be white. Now, several years ago, and this is going back maybe 22, 23 years, I don't, can't remember where I got it, but I was able to get a flitch. So a flitch is when you uh, buy a series of uh, layers of veneer that all came out of the same piece, and they would be numbered. So you had, you know, the next one on top of this came right off that next sec section of the log and right up through so that you could literally leaf through it and see any grain just flow, slowly float away or, or change, but piece to piece. And this stuff was cut a full sixteenth of an inch thick, whereas most veneers you get are gonna be far thinner. This is nice and thick, was easy to work with, and I had it in wide width. Some of, the, some of it I think was, uh, well, I think I had some that was actually 20 inches wide. Now, this is the holly. And if it's an extremely white wood, it's very expensive. Uh, I think it comes out of Maryland in the, in the U.S. It's, that's what it looks like rough, and that's what it looks like once it's finished. And it tends to keep that white color, whereas a lot of them will yellow. And it's hard, and it wears well, and it feels incredibly smooth coming off of the plane. We also use something called aspen. So aspen is almost a weed. I use it as a secondary wood where in some places, in this case, we use it simply on the drawer bottoms. Now that's what it looks like. So it doesn't have the same white color as the holly. It's kind of more of a yellow, but it's a, it's a nice wood. It's soft. It's probably somewhere around pine in terms of hardness and extremely light and also easy to get in very wide widths. So that was the reason why I chose it for the bottom. And also if when you're, you don't want your bottom drawers to be extremely heavy. So the lighter your bottom is, 
uh, the better it's going to be, I think. A lot of people use plywood, but I was trying to be very traditional in this, so it's a solid wood bottom. We used MDF, and I'm going to go through and show you all of this. We used two different sizes of MDF, half inch and one inch. It's available in multiple different thicknesses. Nice thing about it is it's very stable. It's a man-made product. It stands for medium density fiberboard. And uh, Alan Peters actually told me that that was his favorite material for veneering with because of its stability. It doesn't change in its dimension. Now, anyone that's worked with it will tell you if you get water on it, it blows up like a sponge. So you have to protect it from that. The overall length is 40 inches. The height is 36 and 3 quarter. The width is 19 inches. And the height, including this cabinet section, is 50 inches. The legs, in case you're interested, are inch and a half by inch and a half, obviously solid cherry. So just real quickly, all of the uh, pieces in the bottom section are solid cherry. This is solid cherry, as is this and the back. This top is a piece of one inch MDF, veneered on the top side, banded first, meaning a piece of solid cherry was glued on all four edges, and then the veneer was put on top of it so it became a sandwich. The uh, top section, this is all solid cherry. The case itself, front, sides, and back, solid cherry. The lid, because we didn't want it to move, is a piece of half-inch MDF, banded, meaning a narrow piece of cherry, probably a half-inch square, was glued on all four sides, edges, and then sandwiched, and you have cherry top and bottom, so that veneer was used on both sides to make it nice and stable. And I'll tell you when we get into the construction why it wasn't necessary on that piece. Okay, uh, before I start on the overall design of this piece, the finish is a uh, lacquer, and this is the brand. Uh, it's called a Chroma Pro. It's a catalyzed lacquer. It's, what I love about it is it has a beautiful finish. You can, and in fact, actually, we did a video on spraying that that we'll leave a link below and talk, tells you all about it, the advantages, the disadvantages, and it's just, a, I think it's a great product. I want to talk about the base first. And it, I, I didn't want this to look too uh, weak, so that's why the legs, I left them. I didn't taper them. I've built lots of pieces of furniture that have a tapered leg, and it gives it a very, um, I hate to say the word dainty, but a very uh, light look. I wanted this to be somewhat sturdy. If it's going to be used, then it has to be able to withstand a fair bit of abuse going to be pushed around a little bit and if it was pushed around and these were tapered the legs would flex too, flex too much so the legs are inch and a half square I've got a chamfer which is some people call it a bevel but that's actually called a chamfer and then it ends right here on all four corners and then goes right to the bottom now there's also a chamfer that goes all the way around the bottom if you don't do that and somebody moves the desk like this if it catches anything there's a good chance that that is going to tear a piece off but that chamfer will protect it. Very much like when you're planing across the end of a board, if you cut a little chamfer on the far end, you won't get tear out. So what we did on the bottom to make it nice and strong is we used something called a through wedge tenon. So this piece, this stretcher, comes all the way through. Now I chopped a hole called a mortise in the leg. And when I chopped it, it sloped like this, meaning the opening is narrower and it, the, it flares towards the side. So this is why this is narrow. Before this piece passes through, and I must, add, I must add that this tenon is shouldered. So there's a little shoulder all the way around that enables you to get the nice tight fit. You also want a very precise fit because you're actually going to see it. Whereas in a typical mortise and tenon, once it's together, the only time you ever see it is if it fails. In this case, you actually see this side, so your, your joinery has to be very precise. Before the piece is passed through, there are two saw cuts made in this tenon. In from the end, in from the edge about an eighth of an inch or so, and the saw cut is made right to the shoulder, and it's sawed on an angle, so it's very close to the top side. So if it's an eighth of an inch out here, it's less than a sixteenth of an inch in there because you want that to be able to bend without breaking or causing a split to come up in through here. 
Then I make two holly wedges, nice and white for the contrast. And those holly wedges are designed to be the size or the shape of the void created from having a sloped hole or mortise and a piece coming through that is smaller on uh, smaller than the actual opening. Once it comes through, it's all glued, you drive those wedges in, they fill the gap and you end up with what we would call an internal dovetail, extremely strong. So that's the case for the stretcher on the back. That's the case for this piece. But where this piece comes into this cross member, you couldn't do that. What most people would probably thought it would, it would have run this way. But you always have to have that wedge going perpendicular to the grain. If you did it the other way, the wedging action would actually cause this wood to split. So that's why, in order to make this a sufficiently strong joint, I had to put in two one wouldn't be enough, two through wedge tenons, and they're wide spaced wide apart to give lots of leverage, making for a very strong joint. And I also, when I, when I did this, I didn't want people to be putting their feet on there, so I had to make sure that this was far enough back that it wasn't going to be a natural resting spot for someone's foot, and for the customer on that side, I didn't want them standing on it, so that's why I kept this stretcher up high enough so that it wouldn't be a comfortable place to rest your foot. That wasn't the idea. Now, I won't jump right to this, but I will note that in order to carry that theme through, we moved it right up into here, and that's how this center section is held in place, two through wedge tenons as well. Now, if we look at the top section, this frame piece, this is a traditional mortise and tenon, but not a big, long tenon. The reason is, if you were to cut a big long mortise or a hole in this section and you've got one over here as well you take out way too much material and it really is going to weaken it so I always do a double tenon meaning there's a hole or mortise right here then there's a solid section left and then there's a hole or mortise up here and that way that center piece kind of gives some integrity back to the top of this because remember you're cutting it out here and you have to cut out over here as well I also purposely kept this apron out close to the edge so that when the, if you were to look down this way, that mortise being cut into this leg and another mortise over here being cut into that leg, I didn't want them to meet, which again, just sacrifices some of the integrity of this top section. So I made them long enough to give me sufficient glue surface. I actually pinned them from the inside to give it extra strength. And by that I mean, after the joint has gone together, I drill a hole that goes through the inside, goes through the tenon, and doesn't come all the way through here. And now it's a wooden pin that goes in there and helps to lock all of that in place. The glue is probably sufficient, the pinning just helps. And this one done the same way, but again, not deep enough to, for the two mortises to meet, keep some wood in there to help strengthen that section. And we did that all on all four corners. Now, the top, debated about this. Um, really had some uh, challenges. I didn't want, I didn't have a lot of excess, uh, extra uh, cherry veneer. I was getting down in my supply and as you notice the piece I showed you, there was a lot of knot holes in it. So that was a concern as well. But I also knew that if you don't, if you, that you've got to balance a veneered piece with veneer on both sides. So to get around that, I actually took the top made out of one inch MDF, glued a solid strip, uh, solid piece of cherry about three quarters of an inch wide all the way around, mitered the corner so that you wouldn't see it out here, and then I glued and screwed that piece of banded MDF to the base. So it's glued all along to the top of these aprons. It's not going to move, meaning the uh, MDF is not going to move and the piece is never going to come loose. Then I added the veneer after the fact clamped it on and finished it off so I don't have to worry about anything cupping it should be nice and stable now to break up the joint I carried this theme this is just a, a small chamfer out here on the leg it's a little bit wider probably almost a quarter of an inch a little less so on these stretchers just because of the size of the piece that's down to about an eighth of an inch but then I also cut a little I, I cut a little chamfer on this section right up through and I also cut a chamfer on the top so where the top meets the leg, you can break that with that little chamfer done on purpose, but also done just to prevent um, an awkward joint where that would be meeting that 
square on. I didn't think it was going to be appropriate. And then I've got a chamfer all the way along the top edge, and I've got a little chamfer out on here. So this piece, and I'll just give you the dimensions of it, the, uh, the top is 26 and a quarter. It is 18 and three quarters of an inch wide. You'll remember that the top itself, this section, is 19. So anytime you're putting pieces on top of pieces, if you either have to get them perfectly matched, which doesn't always seem to work out very well. So I purposely stepped this in, made it a little bit less. So it just adds a little bit of dimension to the piece when you look at it. Gave me a little bit of a shelf right along here. So this is an, there's an eighth of an inch difference here and an eighth of an inch difference here and an eighth of an inch difference on this end as well. And I just think it adds some, uh, it just adds another feature to the piece that something that maybe you weren't expecting to find. This little top section, and by the way, the, uh, one of the difficulties in finishing something like this is it's like painting a picket fence. There's so much surface area. Well, if you were trying to spray the entire thing at one time, in the time it, take to, it takes to spray all around these pieces, the rest of it would be dry. You'd be getting overspray. So this section was finished and sprayed. The top, just the top, and this piece right here were finished and sprayed. This section was finished and sprayed. Everything below here was finished. Actually, that's not true either. This top section was finished and sprayed, then masked off. And then we, we did, the entire base was done in sections. We did, uh, we did this end with these, these uh, ver uh, horizontal stretchers taped off. And we did the same thing over there. And then we taped them off and uh, it was a lot of work, the finishing. So up here on the top, I wanted to carry the dovetails through, so uh, I, I love exposed joinery. I just think it's, um, I always enjoyed seeing how things are made, so I assume other people do as well. So through, uh, through dovetails on the base section, and then same, same uh, on the top, meaning you see the ends of the tails from here, so you want to see the ends of the tails from here. And I'm very careful when I go in here to make these look as, as symmetrical as possible. And a fair bit of work goes into that, and you'll see that in my dovetail video that we did recently, and I'll leave a link to that as well. And uh, there's there's some complicated bits when you're, especially when you've got angled pieces. You you see you end up with a big what we call a half pin right here, and you just have to kind of balance that. And that's why that piece actually has a little chamfer sitting there to where it meets, because you wouldn't want a knife edge along here; it would be way too sharp, especially if you're reaching in to this. That center piece, as again, as I told you, was held together. It's actually sitting in a very shallow dado. A dado is a groove that is cut across the grain. And then these are through wedge tenons. Part of this that comes all the way through and again wedged for that extra strength. And then what we did here, we just made some a little uh, um, dividers so that, again, it's being used as a desk. This would be a place that you could store your mail and the dividers easily move actually they're not supposed to fall over i'll just show you real quick what they look like they just have a little thin piece of maple because it, you want it to be thin so that it doesn't cause the letters to tip to one side but i wanted to be able to move them so that you can put whatever you're having to put in there and have it all spaced out now when we were designing this typically pigeonholes envelopes sit like this but that would be in the way of the lid opening so that's why we ended up having it resting on the top now as I said that piece was added on so this is this piece this whole section is attached to this piece through multiple quarter inch dowels there's probably about 15 or 20 of them that go all the way around which it was overkill I know but I wanted to make sure What's unique about the top is that it has a wooden hinge. So if you look closely from over here, you'll see that when I lift the lid, this has a wood hinge. I make my wood hinge boxes. I can also use it on furniture. And we'll leave a link below on making the wood hinge. But it's, it's really a, uh, an interesting way of, of putting in something that you need for its function without it being disruptive at all. And not that there's anything wrong with brass hinges, but they don't always fit in, I don't think whereas this completely disappears when it's closed. As I mentioned, this is veneered, and I, had, I didn't have veneer wide enough, so whenever you want to join two pieces of veneer, you've got to do something to either accentuate the joint 
or try to disguise it. And I tried to disguise it by using the sapwood of two pieces to go together. And if you follow it, it comes right down onto this piece as well. So this piece of veneer, remember we talked about it being a flitch. So I have several pieces, one cut right after the next. This piece and this piece came out of, the, came out of that flitch. So if you, open, if you were to open this up and look down at the bottom, you see the grain obviously continuing on here, but you'd also see this as being the same as this piece. Put in a little bit of a, just a little, um, uh, I don't can't even think of what I would call that, but just something to hold your papers to prevent them from sliding off. And this was actually something I'd forgotten about in the original design, so we had to go in after the fact. And I was very careful to cut a very shallow, uh, just cut a very little shallow uh, spot out of the veneer and then set this piece in. This is a solid piece, but I, I chamfered the two ends so that it would just blend right in and really no noticeable joint line right here, but just a little bit of a lip on this side. And again, you wouldn't want to leave that sharp so it's flattened off right on the top. If you followed any of my work, you know I love to make drawers. I love case work. Of course, I love dovetailing. So there's lots of drawers in this. You might not see them just yet. I'm going to point them out. And I did something that I had never done before in terms of how we went about making the drawers. And after we did it, we realized that any kind of a drawer knob on this was really going to take away from it. Not only was it going to take away from it visually, but it was going to be in the way. And if you'll notice, you walk into someone's home, you can almost date their cabinets based on the hardware. It has a way of doing that. So I wanted to stay away from it. it helps to make a piece timeless. So if you look down here in the bottom, there are two drawers. Here's the first one. There's the second one. Now, when I close them, you'll see how well the grain matches up. Now, you've got to follow me on this. So what I did is I took this piece of wood. I ripped off a bottom strip. I ripped off a top strip. I took that center section, I cut, I made a cut here and a cut here, I made a cut back here, and I made a cut over there. I, I then hand planed everything to get as perfect joints as possible. I actually made this cut with my uh, little cross cut saw so that I would lose the least amount of material. Everything was then all planed on, sh on the shooting board and squared up perfectly and glued back together. So this piece was exactly where it was in the middle, glued back together. You don't lose anything there at, at all because it's in the middle. Of course, you're going to lose the thickness of a saw curve right here, plus what it took to shoot it on both sides. But I put this piece, this drawer front, back in place, waxed the corner so that it wouldn't be interfered with by the glue, I kept it full width, glued this piece back in so that it's it's close but it's going to it the joint line is going to be off just by the amount of the two saw curves but it did a pretty good job of hiding and of course we did the same thing over there then we were able to take that frame and use that as the front of the cabinet and on the interior all the pieces all of the parts on the interior of this were designed so that everything moves up and down. Normally when you build drawers and you put it in a case, the case is going to remain stable in, in its vertical dimension and the drawer is going to expand. I wanted to get rid of the necessity to have any kind of a gap, so I built it a completely different way. That's the part I'd never done before. Now if you look over here on the side, there's a drawer on either end as well. I'm going to show you that in a second. But if you can envision, the customer is standing on this side, the clerk is writing up the bill, the customer's needing to sign it, he needs a pen. So what does he do? Well, the clerk on this side opens up the drawer, closes the little trap drawer on this side, and out pops a little drawer that holds a pen, two pens, and a pencil. This was built in very much the same fashion as it was over here, so that we could hide everything and it would essentially disappear. And that was for that servicing the right hand, which is the majority of customers are going to be right-handed, but we couldn't forget our left-handed brothers. So if you come over here, same thing happens. Open the drawer, close the little trap door, which creates uh, um, an airtight seal, or very close. And when you close this drawer, it pops open, and there you have. Now, 
In other words, it doesn't happen if you do it without the little trap door shut. So what I'm going to do is open this up and show you. By the way, let me explain this first. So this drawer was designed to hold all the stationery. Paper, large envelopes, business cards, regular envelopes. People actually used to write letters. Pencils, pens. But I also wanted a secret compartment to store those big bills. So if you hold this piece and pull it out like so, and of course these little pieces had to be dovetailed because it's a corner and if you have a corner you have to put dovetails in it. And we have just enough space in here to hide some important documents. And then that would just sit back in there and if I hadn't have done a YouTube video on it, nobody would have ever known. These pieces are all made out of cherry. This piece is actually out of 8th inch Baltic birch just banded with a piece of birch on the top, so I forgot to mention that in, there, in our list of materials. Now I'm going to pull this drawer all the way out. I've got a little drawer stay in here that is a piece of uh, wood that runs almost a full width. It's sloped in the front and it has two screws that have washers on them on the side and the screws have slots in them. So it falls down into place. So to open the drawer, to remove the drawer, I just reach up in there and pull that I lift it up, that allows the drawer to come all the way out. And then when you put the drawer back in, because it's sloped on the forward side, it allows the drawer to pass, then it drops back in place and it catches on that back lip of the drawer and prevents your drawer from getting pulled out too far. Now, let's just come over here and have a look at this real quick before we talk about that cabinet and I'll just show you some of the things about this. So, drawer sides are made out of holly. I love how white that is and I also love how it, it really makes the dovetail stand out. Those dark pins really jump out at you. This is a, a solid wood bottom. So anytime you do a solid bottom, you have to allow for expansion, but you have to make sure that you do it in the right way. That means that the grain on the drawer bottom has to run side to side. Wood is stable in its length. It tends to move seasonally in its width. So what, has, what happens here, is the drawer is the drawer bottom is glued in the front groove it's dry fit in the sides there's a uh, what did i do one screw or two one screw in the middle it has a slot and that will allow for the drawer as it expands to come out the back without interfering or if it were to go the other way it would push the sides out and lock it in place you wouldn't be able to open the drawer all of the expansion goes out the back or pulls in this way just enough so that it always stays nice and tight and I should also mention that your drawer bottom helps to stabilize your drawer and make it very rigid and prevent it from racking so if you bottom it out meaning that drawer bottom is designed to go all the way into those grooves and touch you glue it on the front and because it's touching the bottom of the grooves of the drawer sides then nothing can go this way or that way. Makes for a very stiff drawer. Now, I don't know if I can pull this out or not, but I also designed this so that this could be removed in case the uh, final user decides he doesn't want, he or she doesn't want this. Let me just see if I can get all these parts out. So these are all dovetailed as well. And these are sitting in dados and we screwed them. It seemed to be the easiest way to do it for something that was typically not going to be removed. This piece is a solid piece of aspen that we shaped so that you could your uh, envelopes would slide in there and just a bit of a finger recess that you could get them out. These pieces were solid pieces of cherry. It was shaped on the top just to make a little bit of a tray. And the reason they're spaced like that is so that there's only one sitting in there. You can reach down in with your fingers to grab hold of it. Now this is the part that I forgot to actually fasten together, but that just sits there and provides that little shelf for that secret tray. So when I built this, remember I said I wanted everything to move in unison so that we could get away with as close a fitting drawers as possible. So if you look in here, the sides, which are poplar, go top to bottom. Of course, the same thing over here. And getting this perfectly flush, this was a real challenge because uh, it couldn't have any kind of a lip there because if you did, you would lose your fit out here. And it was a bit of a nightmare. In fact, the original plan was to have something, a piece of MDF clamped onto here, have that piece clamped uh, against the MDF so that the joint would flush. But it didn't work out perfect. 
I had to go back in here with a special plane called a jack rabbit plane, which allows you to cut all the way to the side and trim that out. And it was a fair bit of work. These strips of cherry, this is what I use as a drawer stop. So the drawer actually runs on these pieces of maple. We had to pad this out as well, which is nice and smooth. Same thing up on the top. And then these strips simply are put in there so that the drawer front stops against those and keeps it nice and flush when it's closed. Now, if you look up in here, you'll see a little bit of an opening. And the idea is, if you look underneath, you'll see a trap door. So the way that we open this is your finger goes up in that hole and there's a little wooden V I'll show you on the underside of the drawer. And that's how you open the drawer. If you close this little trap door, it creates an airtight, somewhat airtight compartment. And this opening goes into the drawer cavity where the small drawer is. And it's that puff of air that pushes that little drawer out and makes it so sneaky. So that little trap door allows you to control whether or not that little drawer stays in place. Now, let's have a quick look at the little drawer on the side. So I have to open this up, close the trap door, this one, and I kind of, I wish I had thought it through a little bit more. What we did for a drawer stop on this one, because you didn't want that to come flying out, is I used a piece of brass. I made a little piece of brass that would, gravity alone would allow it to drop down. But what I didn't do is I should have cut a chamfer on the front of that as well, so that when you put it back in, it would just allow that drawer to pass and then drop down in. Instead, I've got to get a thin piece of metal to hold that up in place in order for that to work. Now, that was a little bit of an afterthought. Uh, same idea, same construction, it's very similar. This, uh, cutting these little tiny dovetails is always a challenge. Regular dovetails are so much easier. This little framework just sits in there, so it's uh, a couple pieces of cherry and a couple pieces of, of holly, and that too can come out if you need to, but hopefully it'll stay there. This, these drawer bottoms were actually made out of 8 inch Baltic birch ply, two screws, same type of construction, even though it doesn't need to be, you always have your grain running this way, kind of a traditional thing. Glued in the front groove, actually this one I didn't bother to, but it could be glued in the side grooves as well. So this side, remember this was very uh, traditional and dating back 50, 60 years ago when people used to use cash, so this would be the cash drawer. Open your Actually, it's a great lock, too, because if no one knew that that little trap door was there, they wouldn't have to open the door. The drawer, they wouldn't even see that it was one there. Reach in. This was the money drawer. And this is all, this is removable as well. Took a solid piece of cherry with a round bottom plane and made it curved so that you could get your money up out of there. And then in the back, you keep the big bills. This is all dovetailed on the four corners as well. And then uh, dados here on the uh, side and front to back. Now, inside. So we open up the lid and I must mention that we, one of the things I was worried about is, is where is, how, what's gonna hold that lid from falling and I don't want marks on it. So we designed it so that it just past the, uh, the balancing point, it just starts to touch. And if it's making contact over most of that length, then you should never end up with, a, with any kind of a mark on there, fingers crossed. Okay, so inside, I uh, didn't want to just have square corners because one of the problems is when you try to work, wipe dirt out, if you're going into a square corner, it's very difficult. So I cut some little cove molding and uh, um, coped the corners. I didn't bother putting a piece in the back because it was way in there. So these pieces are just butted into the back, coped in the front and held in place. They're glued in place, it just kind of dresses it up. But now we have three drawers here again like to hide them in plain view. Same piece of wood, did it the very same way we did the front. Reach up underneath, pull your drawer out. So this is just a hole, an access hole, and on the bottom side we got a little piece of, a couple pieces of wood that create a little V, and that's where your finger catches and enables you to open the drawer. And again, those little drawers are so much more difficult than the regular ones. Holly and cherry, we made, we used the, uh, we used eighth inch Baltic birch on the bottom of these. So it's just kind of cool when you see them all opened up. I don't know what'll go in here, but the idea was it was ever, that whatever you were gonna put in here, you probably won't have access to it. So I designed these to purposely be able to take them out like that. And 
can't remember exactly how we attached all of this, but I know it's secure. We built this box that the drawers sit in separately and then put that in place after the fact. Oh yes, I do remember. We, uh, this is screwed in place and I, I actually created a little ledge so you can't see it, but this piece of cherry that you're looking at is actually not the back piece. It's a separate piece that allows this long rectangle to sit down on and then held in place here as well with the screw on either side. All of that is on video, by the way. The entire build, every part of it, is on our online workshop. I think we had over 270 episodes, but uh, the folks that uh, pay for that service want to see it all, so they saw it all. Warts and everything. Love the piece. Next best thing is giving it to somebody and letting them, letting them enjoy it, but Cherry has got to be one of the most beautiful woods to work with. It machines so well with hand tools. The color is uh, incredible. Ah, love it. Wood is good. Uh, if you like my work, if you like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. And I've always said better tools make it a whole lot easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools, and also talk to you about our online and in-person workshops. Good luck in your woodwork.